Cyberpunk 2077 could have been a mecha. That's right, and I'm not even just talking in a regular futuristic warfare aesthetic, but rather literally pulling from Gundam itself as inspiration. Okay, well, saying 2077 never had Gundam mechs in the drafting phase would be a bit of a stretch, but there's a future out there that it exists. How do I know? Well, it of course always loops back to the tabletop RPGs written by Mike Pondsmith that share a canonical universe with 2077. At least, most of them do. The specific timelines I'll be looking at with you today are the Cyberpunk 2020s and a lesser known TTRPG, Mechton Zeta. More specifically, the supplement, Starblade Battalion. Which one will I not be looking at today? Probably the Mecha Zio Poser Gang from the defunct V3 timeline. I just, I, I just don't want to think about it. So there's a lot to learn and go over today, especially considering the advent of a fifth corporate or rogue AI war in the upcoming 2077 sequels. We may even be on the delivering or receiving side of this sort of weaponry. Though I'll have another video out soon covering what war looks like in the not so distant dark future. So if you enjoy content covering cyberpunk lore and theories, please consider subscribing and checking out some of my other videos. Without any further delay, let's explore the use of mechs in the cyberpunk setting. To preface everything that comes after, I should probably define, at least what I can gather, what a mech is. Typically the term is used to describe giant humanoid walking vehicles that are piloted. Though these mechs vastly vary in size, shape, and appearance, making it difficult to discern a one definition fits all. Especially since ignoring science fiction, mecha really is just an abbreviation for mechanical, which encompasses all mechanical objects, including cars, guns, computers, etc. What makes it all the more confusing is its close relative, power armor. The distinction between the two can become hazy at best usually dumbing power armor down to being form-fitting while mechs are, are much larger than the pilot. Though between the two obvious distinctions of power armor, like Iron Man or Gundam mechas, there's a size range that stops being that of form-fitting but not quite to the point of having a fully sized cockpit surrounding the user. It's this range that things like Iron Man's Hulkbuster and many of Cyberpunk's canon material falls into. Some will be more apparently power armor that fits over and follows the wearer's movement, while some may have a small form cockpit or some other way to mimic the wearer's movements. Like many series in the cyberpunk genre, there's generally more to do with power armor and augmentation, but the tech is still there. So ample warning that this first section of the video will be covering primarily power armor and the lore behind them in canon. If you would prefer to only dive into the possible, alternative future of 2077 known as Mechton, then feel free to use the labeled timestamps. The origins of this weaponry date back to the 2010s with the creation of the Jacksuit by Metacorp, a nomad nation founded as a security and maritime construction firm. The Jacksuit was the world's first assisted combat personnel armor, abbreviated as ACPA. One of the top rated solos of the time, Racer Chiba, was of the first to pilot the prototype. Not long after, the patents were sold to Militech in 2017, allowing Chiba to go freelance as a top mercenary with his knowledge around the armor, albeit still in large thanks to the skills he picked up as a second Central American war vet. Thanks to his appearance on the scene, a lot of the stigma around power armor was relieved in the solo career, opening the door for many. As time went on, progressions were naturally made. ACPAs increased in size, some had standalone weapons, some mounted, and some both. More common suits like the Arasaka Standard B and Zeta Tech Grasshopper were modest and fit like a glove, while others such as the Militech Commando or Russian Arms Bombardier were much bulkier and didn't fit to normal human proportions. During the Fourth Corporate War, the Firestorm, Stormfront, and Shockwave books gave us further look into alternative ACPAs. Pooled assets between Militech and IEC created the EVPA project, extravehicular powered armor meant to operate at deep ocean levels and hostile environments in order to provide additional advantages during the Shadow War. Though once the war went hot, it can be argued Arasaka had a much more terrifying development, the Dai Oni, the first interlocked cyborg body and ACPA, a 3.4 meter, 1.12 ton monster, though it wasn't necessarily its sizing that put it above the rest, as many shared similar specs. 
It was a fact that the user would be an alpha class cyborg, modified for incredibly inhuman reflexes and speed, specialized to run that suit specifically, meaning that a biopod was running the entire operation. This to me somewhat calls into question its validity as a power armor though, seeing as it's essentially an extension of a full body conversion less than actually just being worn, hence the interlocking. Though there's only a handful of these ever made, and it was famously donned by Adam Smasher during his duel with Morgan Blackhand atop the Arasaka Towers. If Arasaka had managed to make an army of these ahead of the raid, the outcome of the war may have been very different. Following the war, because of shortages in how the Time of Red functioned as an era, advancements weren't really made at the same rate until the Edge Runner era. A time period that just generally introduces us to a lot more exoskeletons and frames than anything else. First being the experimental exoskeleton David dons against Militech, and then Adam Smasher. Then of course the Militech Centaur used by Maelstrom's Royce, the NCPD, and several Cyber Psychos. A Militech grade exoskeleton designed to provide its pilot with increased defenses while also granting powerful offense. Following that, there's lastly the Militech Minotaur, that actually gets defined as a Militech manufactured mech, though it must be in the more traditional definition, seeing as it's remote controlled. Personally, haven't busted it open, so there just might be a cockpit, someone might have to ch check that one out for me. And that really would be all I have to say for anything close to mechs in canon, if it weren't for the existence of concept art which isn't confirmed canon but at least provides a glimpse into the development process and what was initially considered. Again though, it's concept art. Not much to dig into besides showing you all the images. Yes, most of these are exosuits and, and power armor again, but in varying styles and fashion. But it's these images by James Dolly that showcase an alternative model of the Militech Minotaur. A version that while appearing with a similar graffiti and NCPD logo, now has a cockpit. These enemies certainly would have been formidable and a welcome addition of a remote controlled counterparts, which in my opinion, were heavily underutilized in 2077. So that's all I have to say and show in relation to ACPAs, 2077, and canon. Again though, if this interested you, be on a lookout for a full-fledged war in the world of cyberpunk video that will be covering everything you need to know about corporate war weaponry and technology. Now, we can get to the more absurd version of Cyberpunk 2020's future. Mechton is a game series self-published by Mike Pondsmith that begun in 1984 thanks to an interest in the mobile suit Gundam manga. While the first edition was created as a box tactical war game, the following would implement role-playing mechanics in the interlock system later used in Cyberpunk 2020, which of course also makes it possible to use Mechton's system as a basis for Cyberpunk mech implementation. While Mechton tends to take place in its own fictional setting, separate from any of Mike Pondsmith's other works, its sequel Mechton Zeta has a supplement campaign titled Starblade Battalion, specifically set in the future of Cyberpunk 2020. To quote Artalzorian itself, from the ashes of the cyberpunk age, through ecological holocaust and the specter of extinction, humanity has finally risen, like a phoenix, to conquer the stars. An entire future history, which is one possible e extrapolation of the cyberpunk 2020 future. So, much like the 2020 supplement Deep Space that has some retcon 2030s lore, Starbleed Battalion is also an alternative future of the 2020s. Much like many other source books, like B3 and Cyber Generation, both of which I covered in a previous video, that this should have been included in, but I'm an expert idiot, so my bad. So none of this is confirmed canon, but is set far enough out from 2020 to not really matter anyway. So when does it specifically take place? Well, in the year of 2180, of course. So even with the time skip to 2077, it's still another 103 years out. But I guess when you have characters like Sabro, who is 158 years old, it's not that long of a gap. So why does this book have a shared universe with Cyberpunk 2020? Well, we can thank the designers for explaining why in the first couple pages. It ultimately comes down to one point. The world they had designed seemed to be a very logical extension of Cyberpunk 2020. So it seemed natural to use the depth of background and history at their fingertips to flesh out the early history and sociological underpinnings of the Starblade saga. 
For example, nanotech-based Bioware became highly advanced descendants of traditional cyberware. The data web, a highly sophisticated info-sharing network, derived from, of course, the net. And every person implants a data link by the age of 17 to access said net. And the mechs themselves? A simple extension of the ACPA, that are standard mil-spec hardware in 2020. The large-scale milomers proved even more efficient on larger exoskeletons. So while this new world is very different, its roots can be traced back to the cyberpunk age. The period from the turn of a century until the early 2040s is often called the Cyberpunk Age, for its violence, rampant technological and sociological experimentation, and general lack of stability. By the end of said era, megacorps such as Militech, Petrochem, and International Electric stood alone as the only ones capable of large-scale organization and activity, managing to consolidate their power and beginning an unavoidable campaign of development to every corner of the globe. Their greed was insatiable. Having complete control of raw resources and markets of Earth wasn't even enough, and so they aimed higher, reaching out to the early orbital habitats and beyond to the asteroid belt. And with their cities, even the nets spread as far as Mars. By 2070, the Earth faced complete ecological disaster and had even been sterilized by pollution and waste. In face of countless deaths at the hands of destructive new weather, plagues, and more, the ecological emergency government rose to challenge the corpse. An alliance of the few remaining national governments joined together to try to stem the tide of eco-collapse. Naturally, the megacorps forcibly resisted their military forces, as the lion's share of proposed measures would severely hurt their bottom line. There's no room for negotiation, so the EEG activated its remaining national armies and launched the Unification Wars, which of course deserves a sidebar. While different from the canon Unification Wars between the NUSA and Free States, there's many examples such as this from varying alternate timelines and retcon material that later gets reintroduced in canon. Despite the fact Unification Wars aren't unique to the cyberpunk universe, they appear in all sorts of sci-fi such as Warhammer. It just shows Pondsmith was interested in doing this sort of thing at some point, especially since this is an extension of the 2020s, and even falls along a similar timeline, though it lasted much longer in Mechton. Ultimately, the corporations were forced to withdraw to their orbital colony strongholds and pursue peace. By 2090, the wars had all but ended, and the individual governments of Earth dissolved as the EEG was declared the unified authority overseeing the long and difficult road back from self-destruction. The corporations which had sided with the EEG early on were given preferential placement in the newly formed Economic Council, and all corporations were forever banned from having armed security forces of any kind, a decision that the canon timeline severely needs. From that point on, there's a massive shift away from what we would know as the cyberpunk genre. There's a lot more to the story if it wasn't already obvious, as that was all precursor for the transition from the cyberpunk era to a mecha setting. But this video isn't really meant to be a mechton deep dive, so I'm going to be selective and aim towards cyberpunk oriented information. One key player from cyberpunk isn't so surprisingly still around after the unification wars, which honestly, I bet you could guess. That's right, the Biotechnica Corporation. Or, or maybe you weren't right, I don't really know. I can't hear you. They might fiddle around with unethical practices, but they do like saving the Earth. What ultimately endeared them to the USSA Economic Council was that they had managed to store huge gene banks of plants and animals long thought extinct. These genetic archives possibly contained as many as 75% of Earth species chirogenically preserved until a reconstruction program could be put into place. And now with government funding, Biotechnica is reinstalling these animals into the biosphere as it heals. Biotechnica has spent enormous resources and time to make itself invaluable in just about every environmental rehabilitation project conducted in the system, as well as a few in the colonies. So while Biotechnica is thriving, not so much could be said for other corporations that dug themselves a little bit too deep into warfare. Keep in mind that Biotechnica is legitimately one of the nicer, more helpful corporations even in 2077. They're not perfect by any means as they are still a megacorp, but they do have a much healthier impact on the general environment. 
so it's nice to see they have good branches no matter the timeline. So, being a mecha and all, there's a lot to say about the Mechtons and their combat system. But unless you're planning on running a campaign or a combat scenario, there's not much reason to dive into it. Besides being badass as usual and previously stated the natural progression of ACPAs, there's not much else beyond what you might learn in any other mech-oriented series like Gundam. Though if there's enough interest from you guys on Mechton itself rather than just its cyberpunk-based supplement, I wouldn't mind making a video diving into all those specifics. The big question to end it all. A theory of somewhat like my typical videos contain. Will anything like mechs appear in Cyberpunk Orion or other 2077 media? Well, no one knows the answer for sure. They can certainly continue on their way with ACPAs, but it's also certainly possible that inspiration from series like Titanfall, Mechton, or even 2077's own concept art is used. In the upcoming dark future, a fifth corporate war and rogue AI invasion seems inevitable. With technology the way it is, nearly everything being able to be quick hacked by a talented netrunner, net connected gear seems a lot less desirable. Now you can make an argument for a self dependent power suit being the next step, but keep in mind that, that if for any reason this gear seizes up, the user is entirely stuck inside. There aren't much mechanisms you can put in a skin tight suit for a user to get out without any power. What I propose is it's much more reasonable to be in a cockpit even if it's small, allowing for the capability to pop a hatch and hop out in the case of total failure. After all, it's been 50 years since the first ACPA prototype, and despite the time of red being a bit of a dead zone in relation to advancement, science picked up vastly in the new Edge Runner era, allowing us to see all the new technology contrasted in 2077. So to say there's capability to make these mechs a reality is likely an understatement. It's really more of a question on if such designs would be reasonable to produce in-universe, and what Pondsmith would like to include in his own series. If I were to place eddies on it, I'd say it's likely we see large rogue AI piloted robots, kind of like in Phantom Liberty. But the likelihood of seeing a piloted mech remains slim outside of what we've seen in concept art. Now that fits the setting much better. But I want to hear what you all have to say. Would you be interested in seeing mecha-like technology in Orion, even if it's just a boss fight or two? Or would you want it completely separated from the IP? Personally, I would love to at least be able to use ACPAs and conversions in the next game, while keeping a mech-like enemy only as a boss fight. Perhaps even a prototype just piloted by a rogue AI. Luckily for us all, CD Projekt Red opened a studio specifically to get Orion done as soon as possible. As always, a huge thanks to all the channel members up on screen. It's been way too long since I released a video, but if you stuck around this long, I have some news for you. All that time hasn't been spent doing nothing. I actually have a lineup of scripts already completed, and I'm going to tell you what they are. The Cults and Religions of Cyberpunk 2077 Short Stories from Night City Legends The 20 Strongest Solos of the 2020s the Art of War in Cyberpunk 2077's Dark Future. The Kompeki Heist was a setup. Cyberpunk 2077's Theory Iceberg Compilation. The History of the Militech Corporation. The Most Influential Characters of Cyberpunk 2077. The Truth Behind Cyberpsychosis. And several compilation and short form videos to come. Now with that Marvel-esque lineup finished, the only thing left to do is just not release some of them. Just kidding. Maybe. Now keep in mind these are scripts, not the final product, so I don't have all of them ready to upload. You're probably also asking why I stacked up scripts instead of just uploading when I could. Well the answer is because I couldn't. I've had very scarce amounts of time to work on content the past couple months, so every bit of time I've had was essentially chipping away at scripts. But hopefully with the scripts out of the way, this will create a more coherent upload schedule for at least a little bit. That's all I really have to say for now. Keep a lookout for further community posts and uploads for other updates. Maybe I'll even upload a video on my abandoned second channel. Anyways, I hope you all have a great week, and I'll see you chooms in the next one. Take care.